sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It is our custom to pause before we study our study the word of God to have a few moments of silent prayer and to make sure that we all are in the same frequency with regard to ground rules. Therefore, to make sure that we are controlled by God, the Holy Spirit, we have a few moments of silent prayer, a recognition of your privacy. You are a priest and a believer, giving you the option of rebound, the opportunity to shift gears, and to pull yourself together in this study of the Word of God this afternoon. Therefore, let us pray. Father, we are grateful this afternoon that the blessings we are receiving in this second phase of your plan had existed billions and billions of years ago, long before we did, <coughs> long before any member of the human race was on this earth. You knew about us, Father, and the blessings came first. We often have adversities and problems and difficulties in time. But the answer existed before the problem. So we are thankful this afternoon and grateful that the answers came first. That all of the answers to all of the problems and all of the difficulties, the trials, the adversities and heartaches are all bound up in your perfect character and essence. We thank thee, Father, for your honor, your integrity, fact that your righteousness and justice are not compromised in blessing us as members of the royal family of God. We ask that God the Holy Spirit would give us now the poise, the manners that we might concentrate on what the Word of God has to say to us. All this we ask in Christ's name, O Lord and Savior. Amen. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <coughs> uh, first of all, I would like to make this announcement that uh, Pastor La Rosa and his family will be leaving for uh, back to the Philippines January. I think you know that already. And this coming uh, Sunday, uh, Pastor Teacher Tom Tyree has uh, declared uh, this Sunday as a special missionary offering for uh, Pastor La Rosa and Cindy La Rosa. So if you have some, well, this offering for the missionary work, uh, you may give to uh, uh, Pansing. She will take care of that and we will give to Pastor La Rosa this uh, coming Sunday. That is uh, uh, part of grace. So this can be utilized in the uh, uh, work, missionary work in uh, the Philippines, particularly in Cebu. And we know that Pastor Tom Tyree's uh, voice tapes are being sent to the Philippines and uh, his uh, voice uh, is often heard every week in, uh, I, I think it's DYKC in Cebu. So let us pray the La Rosas and uh, the Tyrees for this uh, for the continuance of the ministry in uh, spreading the Word of God and uh, uh, in evangelizing uh, the Philippines, uh, which we know is facing the fifth cycle of discipline. We are just basing it on the doctrine that we have uh, been studying 
that uh, any, any nation, for that matter, or which is negative to the Word of God, uh, can uh, expect God's justice. So we have already studied uh, uh, God's perfect essence. One of it, one one of which is His uh, justice. His justice is perfect. So. Uh, we have to adjust to his uh, justice, otherwise his justice will adjust to us. So this is the principle that we are standing on. So I hope uh, that will be included in uh, sending uh, to, uh, to Pastor Rosa uh, this coming Sunday as a special missionary offering. So we can uh, bring that uh, uh, help, uh, financial help to uh, Pastor Terry. <clears throat> this coming Sunday. <clears throat> okay, we will continue our discussion on the doctrine of uh, uh, marriage and divorce. But before we uh, go to that, <clears throat> as uh, a con continuation of what we have taken up, <clears throat> just a review of uh, the function of every believer. We have already said that two major functions of every believer is uh, his being a priest and his being ambassador. So all believers throughout the world are not only priests but ambassadors. Now we have said already that uh, the priesthood, the function of priesthood, uh, you have privacy. As a priest, you have the privacy to uh, a function, uh, just uh, an example for this is uh, confession or rebound. That is an option for every believer, and that is your uh, function as a priest. You go directly to God, to the throne room, room of grace. That is your privilege, which not everybody is uh, availing of. It, this is only for believers. So. We believers are priests, and uh, that function is invisible, that cannot be seen. But the other function as ambassador, or ambassadorship, that is the visible function. Now, what do you mean by priesthood? Priesthood is a group of believers that represent man to God. So we, pr we represent men to God. That is our function as believers. That's why uh, we have the privacy to... Uh, Name all known sins directly to God. All the three major sins that we have already studied. The first and the uh, most devastating and the worst kind of sins being the mental attitude sins. We have examples like pride. We have jealousy. We have uh, bitterness. We have hatred, vindictiveness, implacability, envy, guilt feelings. We have fear. We have worry. We have anxiety. We have self-pity. These are examples of mental attitude sins. So before we study God's word, we have to name all those known sins directly to God. And uh, if we uh, don't uh, make any move as far as uh, rebound is concerned, then the mental attitude sins will go down to the, uh, the second uh, uh, category of sin, which is uh, sin of the tongue. Examples of the sin of the tongue is we have maligning, we have judging, we have bullying, we have gossiping, we have uh, criticizing, we have lying. These are sins of the tongue. We have said already that one mass, one ash, and you can burn down a forest. Uh, one spark, and then the whole forest goes up in flames. So that's how uh, devastating the sins of the tongue is. Now again, if you don't make a move, as far as the sins of the tongue is concerned, it will go down to the third category of sin, which is overt sins that can be visible, like murder, we have adultery, we have drunkenness, stealing, etc. So this makes a believer a loser because he is right there living in the cosmic dynosphere. So the three categories of sins that we have uh, uh, reviewed. So that is our option to name all these known sins directly to God being priests ourselves. That is our function. So that is visible. I mean invisible. That cannot be seen. Because it is within us. 
this is our responsibility to man, uh, uh, responsibility uh, to represent man to God. But uh, the ambassadorship is different. Now, furthermore, the Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest. When we talk about priesthood, the Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest. Now, there are three kinds of priesthood. The first is the time of Gentiles, where the head of the family was the priest. Uh, we call this in our dialect, panahon sa mga hintil. Mga hintil, the time of Gentiles. The, uh, the head of the family being the father or the, uh, the authority was the priest. Now, the second is the specialized uh, priesthood in the age of the Jews. Panahon sa mga hudiyo. Uh, from the family of Aaron in the tribe of Levi. And uh, on the third, the third uh, kind of priesthood is the Lord Jesus Christ's royal high priesthood. Now, at this time, all believers are priests because we are in union with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we are priests being in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is the difference between a priest uh, and an ambassador. Well, as priests, we represent, as we have said, you re we represent ourselves and uh, toward God. We represent men, we represent ourselves to toward God. We have uh, uh, privacy before God. We have, uh, we, we learn doctrine. God depends on our volition, our free will. Whether we uh, we uh, have the uh, we are positive to learn doctrine and uh, advance spiritually and receive blessings. Now you know already that we cannot receive blessings unless we advance spiritually. This is just one of the process processes of uh, spiritually advancing in the Christian life. And then as ambassadors, we represent Christ toward man. See, we represent Christ toward man. We are ambassadors. And uh, uh, we are ambassadors of the public before the world. And uh, we interact with others. As we interact with others, and then we uh, show our spiritual service and give blessings and encouragement. And that's why Pastor Terry says, uh, refreshment to other believers. So that is the difference between a priest and an ambassador. Now, as priests, we are supposed to be to be functioning this proper and to eat, uh, chew the basic food, this, uh, the liquid, see, the milk. So this is the basic Christian doctrine. Learn this and continue. Do not stop there. Otherwise, you only become a baby Christian. Even though you're already 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, you still remain a baby Christian. You're not growing. So, uh, you have to continue. Well, the next uh, gate is the enforce and genuine humility. That's being teachable. You cannot be teachable unless you become humble. And uh, humility is a mental attitude. And then the fourth is spiritual momentum. Perception and application of doctrine. Be ye not only hearers of the word, but be ye doers of the word. See? So, not only you listen to uh, the teaching of uh, Bible doctrine, but you take in, you believe in, and have, uh, as Pastor Tyler would say, have faith to believe. Have faith to believe. And so, you continue with your spiritual momentum. Uh, this will push you up. And make you advance in your Christian life. And then, as you continue, you go to gate number five, which is personal love for God. Then, uh, you are now a grace-oriented believer. So, you have personal love for God. Everything that you do, you do it as unto the Lord. See? You do not do it for yourself, but for, uh, for, or for others, but you do it as unto the Lord. You have personal love for God, and then you continue to uh, gate 6, which is impersonal love for mankind. See? You love everybody. Everybody un with unconditional virtue, love. And then we, you continue to uh, gate 7, which is momentum testing. 
you will be tested how strong your faith is. That's mo uh, momentum testing. And uh, you continue to the uh, last gate, which is the winner's gate. See? Winner's gate. This is spiritual maturity. And when you reach here, you already become a winner. And you glorify God. Because you have already gotten the source of virtue. And not only you have gotten the source, but you now have, you acquire now virtue, honor, and integrity. That's why you are now called an effective salt of the earth and light of the world. So you become a successful believer, a winner, and when you enter married life, you are sure to have happiness because married life is not full of happiness. It is virtue, honor, and integrity that makes you uh, achieve happiness in married life. Now, <clears throat> okay, is there any questions so far? I want some questions if you have. Okay, uh, it is only in gate six that you as a believer can find the impersonal love. That's impersonal love. Now we have some points here. Uh, there are ten points under the doctrine of personal and impersonal love. By the way, is there any question about personal and impersonal love? Is this clear to you now? Personal and impersonal love. Is this uh, clear to you? Personal, okay, uh, let me let me clarify this again as a review. Personal love is that love that you direct to the object of your love. And you look at the quality of that object of your love. That if she is beautiful or she is handsome, or she is strong, or she is, uh, you know what I mean is uh, both sex. If he is a boy, of course, he is handsome. If he is a, a girl, she is uh, beautiful. In other words, the quality, okay? The facial uh, feature of that uh, object of your love, if she is good, you love her. She is, he is good, you love him. But he, he becomes, uh, uh, he is... Uh, not gentle and faithful to you you do not have love anymore in other words personal love is weak it's very weak because you depend on uh, the object of your love see but impersonal love is different you focus your attention to yourself because you are standing on the principle of the virtue honor and integrity the the, the word of god that you are standing on see no matter what uh, quality the object of your love is that is what we mean by unconditional virtue love that is the key to achieving happiness in married life so I hope that's clear now now yeah we have heard of so many kinds of love another kind is the agape love what's the difference between all right agape, now, love? agape, agape, agape is love. love personal love for God that is agape love so Could it be personal or impersonal? Because if no. it is personal, it means that it is more of Okay, okay then. That's a good question. That is personal love for a believer for God. You cannot achieve impersonal love unless you pass gate number five. See? Now you have to enter gate five first before graduating in gate six. So that's for God. Yeah. You, you, you must have, you have to continue uh, taking in doctrine and apply and metabolize the doctrine uh, apply in your life so you can develop the personal love for God. Anything that you do, anything that you think is personally uh, you, you direct it as unto the Lord. That is personal love for God. But you cannot develop this unless I mean you cannot develop in personal love unless you have already uh, developed personal love for God. So just continue. You don't have to stop there. What's, what about my love for my children and my wife, for example? Personal. Personal. <laughs> of course. My wife, for example. My wife. Is that personal or impersonal? 
that's how I have said. Personal love is for the object, okay? Now, when it comes to impersonal love, that is the result already of your being uh, grounded to gate five. You have developed that personal love for God. So in other because words, you cannot, now, you cannot love in the real sense of the word as doctrine would want us to follow. You cannot apply that impersonal love unless you have already developed personal love for God. Because that is the right way to, that, that, uh, that is the, that is the uh, requirement or requisite that you can apply impersonal love. I mean, it would be easy for you to apply impersonal love once you have that personal love for God. See, in other words, the key is develop that personal love for God, the, the other things will just follow suit. So in other See, words, agape love is impersonal love in the end. It is personal love. Personal love for God. But for God. Personal love in no. the end because you pass there and then in your treatment with other with people, for example, for example, I love the poor. I love the destitute. Okay, that's what I right. love the personality that I really love them. But it is just because I have a feeling that I should help them, that I should do something for them because I love God. Huh. My love for God, my love for my God, my God has given me or developed in me the love for my neighbor. Okay, yeah, get the point. What I mean is, this can follow suit automatically once you've developed, what I mean, develop personal love for God. You don't have to start with impersonal love because that's impossible. You cannot apply as God will want, to, want you to apply effectively unless you have developed personal love for God already. See? It all begins with God. Yeah, I, See? That, because right now... That. Uh, my question yes. is, if you have personal love for God, is it synonymous with the impersonal love for uh, other uh, That's right. like neighbors? No? Yeah, uh, sure. It, it follows. It, it follows. In other words, it, it can be interrelated. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no more problem mm -hmm. with that kind of love. My problem now is, what kind of love is the love that they have for Person. my wife? Well, for my wife. Person. When we talk about, uh, don't, don't, don't be confused with this personal and personal love. Personal is directed to your wife, okay? And to your loved ones. Personal, that's personal. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to standing on doctrine, and supposing you love, of course, you love your wife, okay? You love your wife. That's, that's natural. Unbelievers and un, uh, unbe believers and unbelievers apply personal love, okay? But uh, the bottom line here, what I mean is how you react to your love you have directed personally to your wife when she gets angry or she uh, names, na names, names toward you or something is... Uh, going on, there's trouble there. Can you still apply that personal love? Yeah, See, I can still apply that, especially if I'm already with that dynasty. Because I will be easy to adjust to her uh, That's nature. Right. Yeah. Uh, because of my personal love, and which has been developed for years, I am more considerate. Mm -hmm. I am more it. understanding. Yeah, that's it. So whatever nature she shows to me, I will uh, allow it to happen, and I will just be, you know, patient about it and maintain the love. Yeah. In other so words, it change. Okay, but the has something to say. I think, I think, I think uh, impersonal love is a matter of a mental attitude thing. Supposing yeah. uh, there is a, you love your eight enemies. You cannot love your enemies, but you don't have a mental attitude of that enemy. Okay, so that's it. She is mentioning now mental attitude. Now, that's right. Agape love. That's why I'm talking about agape, agape love. Is personal love. Agape, agape love. Because okay. agape love is the only thing, kind of love, that can really make it possible for us to love our enemies. Without agape love, I cannot love anyway, but maybe I can. To clarify this, agape love is personal love for God. Okay? For God. Okay, that's personal love for God. And you, and uh, we can achieve this by entering gate five. Okay? Now, impersonal love for mankind, that includes your wife. Right? Because and for many words. Love your wife, your loved ones, and your neighbors, and enemies. That includes your enemies. See? And you can, up, you can apply this impersonal love already because you have already developed that personal love, that agape, you said, that agape love that you have uh, been nurtured as, as you have 
been staying on gate number five. See? You have that personal love for God, the agape love, and then it follows suit to apply in personal love for mankind, your wife, your loved ones, your neighbors, and your enemies. That is what we mean. In other words, impersonal love is a relaxed mental attitude. That's the other name for impersonal love. Do not be confused. You remember the uh, you remember the edification complex of the soul? Oh, you forgot already? The edification complex, the ECS. The five stories of the ECS, edification complex of the soul. First is grace orientation. The second is mastery of the details of life. The third is relaxed mental attitude. That is impersonal love. See? So as we continue studying God's word, we, we, we uh, build the edification complex of the soul. That is relaxed mental attitude. That's personal love for mankind. So I hope that is clearer now. Uh, as we go along, as we continue. I think it's clear enough. Yeah, as we continue. My only, my only question is whether agape love yes, is uh, synonymous with the love that or could be a channel for the development of the personal love. Because agape love is usually mentioned in, you know. Yeah, that's very common. Yeah, there are uh, past those they always mention. Yeah. Okay, love. let's discuss these 10 points so you can make this clearer. Okay, just listen to this. Uh, the first point here, uh, under the doctrine of personal and impersonal love, uh, it says here, impersonal love, or, uh, or otherwise called relaxed mental attitude, impersonal love is manufactured inside the DD. Okay? It's for sure for divine dance fear. It emphasizes the integrity of the subject. See? Subject. Who is the subject? I. I love my wife. I is the subject. See? It emphasizes the integrity of the subject. Okay? Now, personal love emphasizes the attractiveness of the subject, of the object, not subject. You get it? Im that is personal love emphasizes the attractiveness of the object. Now, point two, personal love are directed toward a few people, but impersonal love are directed toward all mankind, both the attractive and attractive. Point three, impersonal love as a functional virtue is motivated by love for God. That is why we call the personal love for God as a motivating virtue and since God has no prejudice, impersonal love eliminates prejudice from the life. See? And then point four, impersonal love is not developed or sustained by the object of love, but the believer's residence and function inside the divine love sphere. Point number five. Impersonal love cannot be corrected or deceived by flattery, by human approbation, by emotional relationships, by arrogance. Cannot be corrected. Six. While personal love is optional in life toward people, impersonal love is commanded for the Christian way of life. Point seven. Impersonal love is directed toward all mankind. Personal love is directed toward a few. See? Not a personal. To your wife, your loved ones, to your children, to your neighbors. To God. To God. That's few. Okay? That's personal. 